Um, Lar and Keen, the, uh, Friday 7 wasn't the first time you guys worked together yeah. in a film. You guys were both in another, shall we say, a little bit more weirder horror <laughs> franchise with House. Well, it has too. Came, so it would be more weird. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's, also, it's also the franchise that became known because they just basically swapped out Cheers actors right. and didn't really explain why. <laughs> right, that's true. Right, House 2 was fun, super fun. Did you guys work a lot together on no, that project? Or? No, my character was in the, in the yeah. real world reality, mm -hmm. and you were pretty much in an alternate reality, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, I was doing, you know, I did stunts in the movie and uh, played the character, but uh, did all the house movies, which I really enjoyed. I loved those yeah. movies. Yeah. yeah, so much fun. The first one, especially, was so different. And, I loved uh, it. Yeah, so that's where we first mm -hmm. worked together, and when John Beekler told me that he had hired her to be the lead in the new Friday movie, and I wasn't confirmed yet. And he was fighting for me to play the character, but people were like, who's he? We've never heard of him, so I had to do a screen test. Oh, wow. Yeah, so and that started it all. <laughs> <laughs> And Perry, Perry, you started off a little bit differently. You were doing a lot of television work until um, basically um, uh, Better Luck Tomorrow came around. And that, that just basically seemed to be a film where there was a lot of like-minded people who were just pissed off and not getting any opportunities and decided to do it on their own. Right, yeah. It was uh, it happened in, I think, 2002, the movie came out, and it was uh, all Asian American cast, which is like unheard of, and like um, the director Justin Lin wrote it and directed it, and now he d he does all the uh, Fast and Furious movies, mm -hmm. uh, Star War, uh, Star Trek, um, and, um, and and so he, he basically took the movie out to Hollywood and he said, "We love this movie, we love the script, um, we'll give you all the money you want as long as you replace it with a." Uh, uh, white actors <laughs> and the guy he's like what and but, i mean they're giving them a lot of money they gave him like a million dollars which in the independent world is huge you know and uh, we made it only for 250 so we're getting four times the budget and then he to his credit he says you know i'm not going to make any excuses i want to make it the way i want to make it and he had to make any movies really he only had one other one but he stepped his guns we made the movie he maxed out all of his credit cards went 250 grand in debt was sleeping on the floor, was eating oatmeal while he was editing it, and then it was like a Cinderella story. All of a sudden, we got into Sundance. We filmed 16, 16 films out of uh, like like 24,000 that submit, get in. We got in there. All of a sudden, then uh, we were screening. People loved it. They wanted to buy the movie. They were lowballing us. And then all of a sudden, Roger Ebert stood up and said, you know, he was, you know, saying this movie is amazing and great. And, and all of a sudden, there was a bidding war on our movie. And all of a sudden, um, and I'm the lead actor in the movie, and um, all of a sudden the movie gets purchased by Paramount, we get released, we are the number one movie that weekend. Um, I mean, it's just like a Cinderella story, so it was really cool. Mm -hmm. so you ever uh, call up Justin and be like, hey, I can you know, be Fast and Furious too? Yeah, but he, he's, he's put four of the other actors in, except for me. <laughs> so Adam Green's my Justin Lane. <laughs> And speaking of it, you, you've kind of become, I guess in a way, the good luck charm, whereas Kane's kind of the main focus of the Hatchet films. You're kind of like the good luck charm of the Hatchet series. Yeah, he just keeps you around because, you know, it, so yeah, he just uh, he tries to, he, first the movie, he, he wanted to work with a lot of people again, but he's like, oh darn, I can't because I keep killing them all off. <laughs> and then I said, in the, I kind of inceptioned him, I said, well, you did say he had a brother in the first one. Did you say it? Did you really bring I did. it? Yeah. So like, I think I like Inception. You know, he, while he's writing it, and then, so now it's become a thing now. So you cut his fucking head off with a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> and he comes back. It's a soap world, too. And you, yeah, and you, you played like three different characters through the course of the film. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> and it's, it's weird. It's sometimes when, uh, today, like, when I'm like signing, sometimes people bring up like had to three or two, whatever. I usually sign my character's name, and I always have to like pause and say, "Okay, number two, I'm Justin. Okay, Justin. <laughs> number one, I'm Sean. Sean. I don't want to mess it up, you know." And after the first movie, every time we would get another Hatchet script from Adam, everybody was most excited to see where is Perry going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> How is he going to be in this one? Who's he going to next? And it just says my name in the script, too. It's <laughs> just like, Mary <laughs> Shen, right? <laughs> so I, I 
actually, Laura, I wanted to ask you about um, working with Terry Kaiser in Seven. I mean, he's oh, he's he's a favorite character actor of mine, and he's just so lovably creepy in that. He's so creepy in the film, but he is such a sweetheart, and he's an acting coach also, so we run into each other quite a bit, mm -hmm. and just, he was a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun, and he's very scary, <laughs> um, what he wanted to be. Fair enough, and then of course he became Bernie, not long after right. that. Oh my gosh, that had to be very hard to do. <laughs> so I'm actually going to throw it out to some questions for you guys now, so first up. So uh, this is obviously directed directly at Kane. I'm Lindsay. Hi. Um, also, I'm Mother Mayhem for anybody else that watches YouTube. Ooh, but <laughs> one, yay. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you get asked pretty much every single convention what your favorite kill is. Yes. I want to know what your least favorite kill is <laughs> that you thought could possibly have been better. Wow. Oh. Huh. And uh, not just uh, not just Jason, but also Victor, possibly. Any of your roles, pretty much. Obviously, everybody's probably going to want to hear more of the Jason roles or the Victor Crowley roles, but yeah, I mean, uh, probably uh, in part eight, in Jason takes Manhattan. I kill a cook in a cafe by throwing him into the mirror. I should have done much more because he's the guy that became Jason after me. <laughs> so, uh, I believe I should have fucked him up a little bit. <laughs> Never had that question before. That's good. Well. That was a good question. Anybody else? Come on, guys. You're packed room and nobody has a question? In the back. Um, I recently rewatched a bunch of Well, I mean, you, you always hope that, you know, the timing of our movie was the absolute worst for trying to get something on the screen that's graphic. For some reason, that time of uh, filmmaking, they were taking out everything. Every single kill I did in that movie was so crazy and over the top, and it was cut down to nothing. And people still love the movie. So it's amazing to think of how much more it would have been enjoyable had they left some of the makeup effects in. These people spend months developing something and they shoot it and it looks amazing on screen and it's some fucking asshole <laughs> in an office. No, I don't think the public should see that. You know, it's just so frustrating and every single kill in part seven was cut completely. I mean, when I grab um, uh, Vince, no, uh, uh, who's the guy that I smashed his head? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Smash his head. Smash his head down, yeah. Anyway, that kill looks so amazing in dailies because it was a, a, a prosthetic head that Beekler built that I could crush down to the size of a like a softball, and the eye went flying out and fucking juts of blood, and it looks so amazing. And when you see the movie, it's just almost nothing. Yeah, trickle of blood down the face, that's it. So, um, you know, the fact that people still, it's still my favorite Friday movie that I did, and always will be, just because of the storyline. You know, there's no other yeah, time. Yeah, bringing the story to life. Yeah, no other time did anyone ever have that effect on Jason right. before. So, as a stunt person, it was great for me because she made so many things happen to Jason that it was a lot more enjoyable to to film it as a stunt guy. Acting it, stunt acting. Yeah. Uh, this is for you. How did you feel uh, being able to do the movie? 
Uh, well, that's your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I happen well, to agree, but. But how did you feel being able to get back in and now the truth man can actually you know, have your plan, your plan changed? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was completely felt honored that the game producers came to me, and in their mind, they said, there's no other person that should be doing the motion capture for Jason in the video game than you. So I was very flattered and very happy because there are, you know, quite a few other guys that played the character that they could have gone to. And maybe even somebody that didn't play the character, it wasn't necessary. But in their minds, it should be me. So uh, I was very happy and we, we sh did motion capture off and on for almost two years for the game. Um, so it's a it's a process and it's a weird thing to to try and be scary wearing spandex. But <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe that's uh, I look scarier that way. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it was you know I I've talked about this in interviews, but I didn't realize that the gaming uh, system of motion capture was so sophisticated that I could stand there on the motion capture stage in the spandex suit with all the sensors on it and look at a monitor and see myself live animated as part seven Jason. While doing the motion capture, I felt weird wearing what I was, but I could look at the screen and do movements and see that's how it's really gonna look. So maybe that's a common thing, but I was, very surprised that they had that capability, so that made it easier. And and then once I'm in the the you know the mode of performing as a character, it really doesn't matter what I look like. I just act the same way. So, but I was very happy. Still, um. How hard was it to keep Victor Crowley a secret? <laughs> <laughs> um, it actually wasn't too bad, just because it was always on the forefront of, well, for me, it was on, on our minds, and we would, with all the cast members, I would say, like, you know, we should leak, like, you know, um, uh, misinformation, and show us in, like, Paris or something like that, like, oh, having a great time, like, there's no way they could have shot this because see who's in Paris, <laughs> you know? And then after a while, because I didn't talk about it, I actually kind of forgot that we did it. You know, because it's like almost like like nine months, you know, and then yeah. and then when Adam's like, it's we're ready to go, and I was like, what? Oh yeah, because <laughs> you just like you're forcing yourself not to not to talk about it and think about it, and it just the um, there was really no upside to talk about it. It, it was like there's so much, you know, just to see the reaction that was going to happen. That I'm you know you never seen something like that happen before, so it, it just behooved us to shut up about it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's easy for us to keep the secret. Because we have something to to gain from keeping the secret, but I was surprised that the crew, yeah. who are just day day workers, day players on a movie, they still kept the secret, and they have no really motivation to do so other than Adam saying, "Hey, please, please. don't yeah. say anything." Right. But and you know, progressively, as Perry will tell you, the budget went down on each hatchet movie, so. By the time we did Victor Crowley, the crew was quite small. So it's fewer people that you have to worry about blabbing. Um, but, it, you know, I still was amazed that it didn't seem to be a big shock when it came out. It was so much fun to see the reaction. Because for, you know, months, be at a convention and people come up and say, oh, I hope you do another hatchet movie. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I said, do you, do you think you will? <laughs> already <laughs> done. In, in already back done. In my mind, I'm saying, no, I've already seen it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that who makes, knows? Maybe. <laughs> just to show like how committed everyone was in keeping it, Felissa Rose, who plays my publicist in Victor Crowley, uh, she is really good friends with Caroline Williams, who um, is in number three, right? And Caroline, when she was gonna, she was invited to the secret, the ten-year anniversary screening, which was the secret screening of Victor Crowley. She was, Felissa said, I just had lunch with Caroline, and she came up. She was, we were eating lunch, and somehow word got out that there was a fourth one. She's like, Hey, I just found out. I think they're gonna show. A, I think there's a hatchet four. And then Felissa said, No. <laughs> <laughs> I was 
like, I, was, I had like text messages. I'm like, how did you go? Oh my gosh, he's gonna kill you when she finds out. She's like, I know, I felt so bad, but I had to keep it quiet. And then so during the screening, I'm only watching Caroline. <laughs> and out, as soon as the movie ended, Caroline walks up, strolls up to Felissa, smacks her on the arm and goes, you bitch! <laughs> and she's like, I'm so sorry! But I mean, could you imagine? Like, Caroline's like, what? And, and, and for, for the regular shock stock attenders, that should also pay close attention to, because they were both here last year. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say a word. Yeah. So they're both in the same room for the entire kid, yeah. and of course, mm. Felissa didn't tell her. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Next question. Eric? Yep. Uh, I have a question for Lar. Uh, part seven is one of my favorites on Fridays. Uh, and I noticed you had to kind of maintain a very hysterical kind of pitch throughout the entire thing. You didn't really have very many scenes where you could relax. What was it like trying to maintain that kind of energy level the whole time? And you know, what does the rest of the cast be like when they can kind of take it easy? You know, it, it actually was quite a challenge because we shoot out of order, of course, yeah. and I had to wait on him all the time because you know, <laughs> we were doing something to his face or something. Or, that was a prima donna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't to wait. I don't feel like killing And um, as an actress, it was really fun because I didn't use any artificial tears, didn't really know about them. and. Um, had to really script out the level of the crying and hysteria, which level she was at at each point when she was trying to figure out what was reality and not. So as an actress, I really enjoyed that part, but it did give me a migraine a lot through the, through the shooting too. Oh, but that's okay, I got the effect now. But let me also say <laughs> one, one other thing about that, is that I don't know if you guys have had this happen before or since, but on part seven, we shot not just out of order, which is very common, obviously, but we shot for four weeks in Los Angeles, all the interiors of the movie. And then we went to Alabama and shot all the exteriors. So imagine the difficulty for her going from a scene where she's of one level of emotion going outside for instance now she has to remember how that was a month ago when she shot the interior part of that exact same shot so i was always amazed that that you could pull that off i, de I developed i have an acting school in dallas act uh, actors audition studios and i developed a technique for actors to call script diagramming to break out their entire scripts. So my students work a lot. They're really good. I'm very proud of them. And uh, I developed a kind of like script supervision. I took that idea and then with an actor where I break it down and teach them how to break each individual scene down exactly so that they can know, they know more than anyone in the movie basically. So they know exactly where they leave off and start again because you never know when you're gonna have to go back and forth. And then we did have to go back in LA and shoot more exterior scenes after we had already done them in Atlanta. With more crying, with more dead bodies. Um, we shot, so, it's called pickup yeah, shots. Pick yeah. Yeah. At the end of, very end of March that year, we were doing pickup shots. And the movie was in theaters May 13th. For a director, that is incredibly difficult to do. You're still shooting, and your movie has to be in a wide release in yeah. six weeks. And, and to that point, to that point as well, you're still shooting on film at this point. Yeah. It's not right. like now where it's yeah, not you have video this. village set up. You can go back to your previous scene that you shot a month ago and. <laughs> yeah kind of look it over right. again before you go in, you couldn't do that. No, they that just talked us through it. That makes it right. a little bit more difficult and even more kind of miraculous that you're able to do that. And, and for me, you know, if I was inside and maniacally killing someone, and then I go outside and I have to remember, oh no, that's right, I'm always fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it, it doesn't matter, I was always on the same. <laughs> didn't have any emotion. Yeah. Well, he had emotion when he threw the TV across the room because they couldn't get that to work right. So he said, Mark, step back a little bit and he threw the TV. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That was funny. <laughs> Next question. I'll do another one. Sure, go ahead. I'm interested to hear if any one of you, do you have a dream role or franchise that you would like to continue, like 
for yourself, Harry, would you want to do more hatchet type movies or do you want to branch out into another franchise? Do you want to do more Jason films or do you want to maybe go like Nightmare on Elm Street and Kane, you're kind of all over the place. So what else yeah. would you love to do? <laughs> well, well, Barb was already on. She already did something with Freddy. I did the Freddy's Nightmares <laughs> TV series. See, and right? I never watched it. Which was no, so sorry. great for me. It was my Twilight Zone. Uh, and if the director of Part Six cast me in that uh, Part Part Six of Freddy the Chain. And so I've been able to do a lot of television and different films. And I really did want to take Tina further in her character. That's why I didn't do Part Eight when I came. They came to me with part eight and they wouldn't let me read the script. And I'm like, well, that hasn't worked well for the other girls. They start and they don't make it long. <laughs> and so I'm like, no, Barbara, let me read the script. And she wouldn't. So I wouldn't do part eight. And it was so hard because I love Friday 13th. So I didn't do it. And I always wanted to bring Tina back with her powers and have a daughter have the equal powers and kind of a situation. But, um, I like all kinds of roles. I like scary films. I really do. And I also like the soaps. And I like crime <laughs> scenes. So, yeah, I like to do a lot of different roles. I have one coming out called Expulsion. And it's a very scary woman who's desperate to get the hole closed in the universe because she's been time traveling so much. She's like kind of peeling away. So, that should be out shortly. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Fair. Uh, I am a, I grew up with comics, so there's not many people who know more than comics than I do, so like the fact that all these comic movies have come out are like, it's like a dream come true, right? Um, so I would love to be part of a, a, some sort of canon of something that I've read and just be a part of that. I mean, that just would be really cool. Um, I, I kind of got a little taste of that with, um, I'm one of the characters in Mortal Kombat, so I, I do have like some abilities and things like that, but I mean, be part of like a Marvel or DC situation yeah. that I've read, yeah. that would be really cool. Yeah. We had a house two comic book. We had a house two comic book. It was out, yeah. That's pretty cool. I've got one. And, you know, as working as a stunt person um, for so long before I had any, you know, mainstream notoriety, uh, I was able to work in a lot of very cool, different kinds of movies. Uh, and sometimes playing little roles, like uh, in Daredevil, I was the guy that beat up Daredevil's father in the alley. And, and so that was cool, because I, I was also a comics guy. Um, then I did Monster with Charlize Theron, and uh, she won an Oscar for it, so. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta do that. <laughs> I did a scene with someone who won an Oscar for that role. That's, That's pretty yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I not think of that? It's good trivia right there. Uh, but, you know, I recently have been offered all kinds of different roles because, you know, fortunately, if you have a name in horror, then horror movies mm -hmm. want to have a horror name associated. Definitely. So they know that the best way to interest somebody like me in their horror movie is to offer me a role that I never expected that I would do. And that makes me think, hmm, that's interesting, and then I'll consider it more. If it's the killer, I mean, I'll, I'll always enjoy it, but it's not as intriguing, like, uh, you know, doing, uh, well, for instance, when I did uh, Holliston with Adam, Adam Green, he said, I want you to be in Holliston, I want you to, you know, play yourself. I said, well, that would be pretty easy then. <laughs> and he goes, uh, one of the storylines I want you to do is uh, I want you to um, become suicidal whenever anybody mentions Freddy versus Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at Adam and I said, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you know how sensitive that subject was for so long. And then I, once he brought it up and I started thinking about it, I said, you know what, maybe it's time. Yeah. <laughs> Let it go. So I did that and that was the whole storyline of my, my, my scenes is that somebody says Freddy versus Jason, and I try and hang myself. <laughs> I, I was, I would ask him if he was homicidal as opposed to suicidal. <laughs> right. 
I had a question about part seven and shooting schedule. Like, uh, so many movies go over schedule, especially on a, like when you've got so many special effects and so many things that could go wrong. On, on something this intense, did you stay on schedule? Were you, were you like, I don't know. constantly being berated to like... Woke up the crack of dawn, I cried all day, yeah. and then I <laughs> collapsed, and woke up the next day, and then he kind That's of been lined, terrible for you. He lined me up in another room, and... <laughs> Three and a half hours of fucking I don't know how every, every morning oh before God. you start shooting. I don't know how to do it. Yeah, and so... But I, as far as I remember, we stayed right on schedule. That's we, insane. I don't know how you did it. The, the hard part was, for me, physically, was it's hard to play the character because of the long hours. Literally three and a half hours in the makeup chair before you start shooting. So if you have a 6 a.m. call, you're in the makeup chair really early. And you shoot all day because, you know, you're a character or that's in night. the movie. Or all night. Or all yes. night. And then it takes an hour and a half to take the shit off. Then you go back to the hotel and go to bed or back home. Yeah. So after two months of that, the last two days of principal photography for me were the underwater scenes at the beginning of the film. So I'm thinking, well, it'll be a, you know fairly easy. I'll just, I'll be underwater off and on. Well, it turned out I had to be underwater for four hours at a time without coming up because I was cabled to the bottom of the pool by my ankle because the foam latex that I'm wearing is very buoyant. So I couldn't just stay underwater when I wanted to. I had to be held under. So I had a hookah system, uh, scuba system that my buddy Alan, the stunt guy, would man for me. He, he's underwater as a diver. He'd take my regulator, I'd hold my breath, put the hockey mask on, do the things where I'm held down to the bottom, long panning shots, and I could hear Beekler through a system that he could be outside the pool talking to me and tell me what's going on, and then he'd cut. Alan would come back, I'd purge the regulator and breathe again, but I was underwater for four hours at a time. No. <laughs> And do off and on, and it's a weird feeling. I'm telling you, <laughs> when you're holding your breath, and you're getting toward the end of that fucking breath, yeah. and he hasn't cut yet. So, yeah. not not only does he have to cut, then Alan has to come back in. And I always pictured Alan waiting for cut, and then coming in, swimming in, and said, "Oh shit, wait!" <laughs> but it never did. It, it came close a couple times where I was really getting close to the end, but. It's a tough way physically to end shooting of a physical movie already, so. And we're all going to see this movie in a different way. A different yeah, way, yeah. And we're all going to go, holy shit. And I will not work in water. When yeah. Baywatch came around, they were coming to all of the actresses and were like, you want us to swim in the Santa Monica Bay in a swimsuit <laughs> in that bay for how long? I'm like, mm, -mm not doing water. Mm -mm, I've seen water. <laughs> And meanwhile, there's tours down in Bay Minette, uh, no, uh, what's it, yeah. Bay Minette? Uh, yeah, where we were shooting. It wasn't Bay Minette it was there. Bay Minette. I'm not That's sure. where we were shooting. Anyway, there's tours on that body of water that show where we shot different scenes. Part of the pier is there and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So they give tours for tourists and they show the lake where I was underwater. And somebody told me that, and I said, they said, yeah, we saw where you, the part of the lake where you were actually underwater. And I said, what? It was a fucking diving pool. <laughs> a scuba diving pool that was dressed to look like right. the lake. So, right. Yeah. yeah. One more quick follow-up. Quick follow-up. Uh, do you get the same 12-hour turnaround that, like, everyone else gets? Like, so if you're in there at 3 a.m. one day doing makeup, does that mean the next day they have to work around? They would always try to. Yeah. Because if they didn't give you the turnaround, then you get a forced call, yeah. Yeah. and they have to pay you another grand or something for the day, extra on top of what you're already getting. So they tried whatever they could to avoid that. So. Thank you. Uh, just yeah, you mentioned the prosthetics on part seven and the special mask. Was that typical? You found a prosthetic for all the cases you had to do these other. Has that gotten better over time, or is it still that? The process? Of, 
Well, uh, it has gotten better because it's gone from typically from foam latex, which the removal of foam latex is much longer than silicone. Now they build the makeup with silicone, which I personally think photographs better anyway, because it looks more, uh, yeah, realistic and, and, and the colors are better and stuff, but it's much heavier. So, whereas you're, you know, used to carrying around 15 pounds of makeup all day and now all of a sudden it's 35 pounds, that part gets old because it's far more exhausting physically to work in it. But when you come back in after you wrap and they don't have to use any remover to get the makeup off, they just pull it off because the silicone, when it's used the adhesive, you can pull it off your face without any remover. So it, it comes off so much quicker and that's a relief. So, so how uh, long does it take for the full prosthetic for Victor? Uh, about three, three hours. So it's about the same. Yeah. And he, you know, that has changed over the, yeah. I mean, you can see differences in the makeup over throughout the movies, especially the hair. I loved what the hair looked like in, in the 30s. That's my favorite look of the hair because it was hanging in the face, kind of like Undertaker uh, <laughs> look, and I thought it looked really good. Then it went back to the, the frizzy stuff in Victor Crowley again. Still looks good, but I, I like the other better. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's just, uh, it still takes a good three hours, even though it's not a full body, it's just a yeah. kind of the top torso. <laughs> The first one wasn't campy. No, I thought all of them were pretty campy, but um, I I think that campiness and comedy works so well the way Adam Green does it because he makes the other characters so entertaining and so fun to watch, and it's not at the expense of the scariness of the movie. So that, that's a tough thing to do, and he does it masterfully, where you know you can be laughing at Perry one second, and then the next minute I show up and brutally murder somebody, and you're not laughing anymore, and it, it's just, it's such a roller coaster. And I, I think that's a really entertaining way to watch a movie. Um, I actually have a question for Perry. Um, in all three of the Hatchet movies, or the first three anyways, you're playing a different character each time, and they are, very individual characters. None of them really are the same. And I was wondering how you approach that to make every character different. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just uh, doing the homework, you know? And, and, and um, cause they are, you know, different people, even though it's played by the same person. Um, but just say the circumstances, you know, just kind of like, you know, probably what large your students, just like how you map out your character was the first one Sean he just you know he doesn't know what he's doing so he's just kind of just making shit up you know and, and spinning things and doing different accents to like um, um, cover and then the, the second one with Justin he's just his intention is really just so focused on caring for his brothers and what's going on so that's like his motivation you know so that sets him down a different thing where he's not trying to BS anyone he's like genuinely scared and then um, the third one with Andrew, he is just a paramedic, just sees all these bodies all over the place. He's like <laughs> trying to be a paramedic, like trying to like help everyone. And then you've got this guy saying, hey, I've got these two other Asian dudes who look exactly like you. He's like, okay, I get it. We all look the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> so our, it just, if you kind of just lock it down, it just, it writes itself and, and, and it, it just plays it out organically, you know, and, and it makes things different, yeah. And then, especially with Victor Crowley, then, which was the first time where I actually got to not have to scr start from scratch because I could build upon, like, how would he, this guy be different from when he was 10 years ago? Um, and would he be the same in any way or how different? And is he ashamed of that he hid, you know, to survive? And, and, and how that would affect his actions with his new people in this plane that don't believe him, but he's trying to take care of him because he's trying to, like, make amends, you know? So. 
Yeah, and just a quick follow up: which death did you prefer, Sean's or Justin's? Ah, uh, let's see. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I Justin's um, because there was a lot of stuff that was going on. We had uh, my stunt double. We did, uh, what is it called? It's called a Texas Switch. Is that what it's called? Where some people call it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, where where. Um, they they see me and then they whip to Victor and then he throws um, the hatchet and it and it, it whips back to me and then at that point uh, when it whips back to Victor my stunt double comes in with the, the hatchet already in him and it's we do it and it's like a, and then it was, a, it was this awesome kind of like a camera trick in house camera trick and then um and then when he's grinding away at my head just all the <laughs> it's like they had this prosthetic just like spewing everywhere and then when I at the end of the day when I was like getting cleaned up. I took out my contact to like stained right. red. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> and ever since then, like either the bloods from me or from someone else getting on me, I have always lost contacts through every hatchet movie. I'm like, why don't I just take out my contacts during these scenes? I'm like, I never learned my lesson. Now, did you um, purposely make Justin? It seemed to me that Justin was less stereotypically Asian than in the first movie. Yeah, in the right? first because one. Because he's a different guy, but yeah. you made him far less stereotypical. Yeah, and just less comical. Like, he was not, like, joking around as much as as, as the first one with Sean, you know, because right. his intention was, like, looking for his brother who was missing, right. and he, he felt guilty because he, he gave him this job and said, hey, just get make some extra money, take these guys out on the boat. It's, <laughs> you know, I'm going to give you 50 bucks. So, yeah. Whereas, whereas the first one, you know, is just Adam. Let me do whatever I want. <laughs> the magic trick, and you know, it's just, you know, just when, when when the audience first saw Andrew show up in in the third one, set down the the boxes, the hatchet audience just went nuts because it was him again. Yeah. How? How? Kane, I wanted to talk a little bit about yeah. the new documentary coming out based on. Um, what can we kind of expect from this? Is it a, is the type of doc, did they actually follow you around for a while and then did they get a little bit more uh, personal with your story or is it more a type of career type of retelling? Uh, it's basically the whole life thing again. You know, if you read the book, then you know my story pretty much, but this was a visual, um, you know, version of it, I guess you could say with a lot of interviews for from people I've worked with over the years. So it's kind of their their point of stories, view. point of views and, and and then we also visited some of the places that I talked about in the book. We with the camera crew we went to Hawaii and I don't know if you guys have read the book, but the balcony that I did my hanging off thing to scare my friends. We went to that exact balcony in Hawaii, um, you know, just to revisit that place. And then uh, just coincidentally, we we were granted access to the burn unit I was in in San Francisco, where I finally got to a good place that saved my life. And I hadn't been back there since I was in there. So we just happened to approach them at the time where they were just moving all the patients to a brand new state-of-the-art burn unit in another part of the building. So they let us have access to the unit I was in with all the equipment still in it. So it looked like it was wow. still being used, just that it didn't have patients in it. And it was such a weird experience being back in there and remembering yeah. all this shit that happened so that's all in the documentary and it, it what people really like about it is that it's you know other people's personal accounts of interactions with me and stuff so um i'm just gonna ask each of you what you got coming up next i know i mean if you look at kane's imdb i think it's got 25 <laughs> upcoming credits <laughs> i'm surprised imdb doesn't just say i give up right <laughs> um but um so what do you what you guys coming up next what do you get but do you want to, these guys to know what they can be looking out for? Um, well, I've, I've been working for a while on the story of my life. It's called Lucky Girl. And I've been through a lot of crazy, um, unbelievable crazy things from uh, stalking, stalkings and attacks and 
and sh I got shot at in Texas in my house, like, you know, someone. He, he, was, he was a dumbass, he missed. I'm <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I'll be working, uh, w working on that project and then working with my students and well, just coming back to do different things. Mm -hmm. Uh, the past five years I've uh, recurred on the soap opera General Hospital, uh, so I've been um, doing that, I still am doing that. I have my characters right now uh, adopting a baby, so I'm going to have kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure something bad is going to happen because they're like, you know, like, what could possibly happen? They have my character say, you know, I, nothing's going to jinx the adoption and something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I just shot this movie um, with, um, that uh, Bria Grant co-wrote, uh, co and um, she her and I, a husband and wife team, we create a, a time machine and uh, we send her into the future for like an hour. She comes back and then we're like, oh, this is awesome. You know, we're going to make so much money. And then the next day, another one of her appears at the same time. And we're like, what is going on? And we like do the math and find out we messed up and there's like a looping problem. And then there's like 3,000 of her coming every day at the same time. <laughs> and so then it becomes a, it becomes a horror movie where we just, we got, we got to kill them. We got to kill them all. <laughs> Yeah, and then, and then she wrote it. Awesome. Yeah, she That's wrote it. Cool. It's so clever. And there's three actors in the whole movie. Yeah, it's, uh, Richard Reilly's the third actor. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, um, and so like it becomes really clever. Like, we start getting creative with the kills. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we start gassing them to make it easy for us so we don't have to like actually stab because like, it's like, oh my god, that was so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and then we start playing with like electricity and they're like, oh, it's not so bad, you know, no. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and then later they, they start coming back and they're like, they're already like, they come back, they arrive like hurt or injured or sometimes already dead. Like, what is going on? And then like, there's like weird shit that in the future has obviously happened. So it's just really well written and so clever, yeah. Anything that you want to uh, talk about that's coming up? Um, there's a number of really cool projects that um, supposed to be doing uh, a movie in Spain, a Western, cool. um, and I just got word that I'm doing a movie that um, I just found out Thursday that uh, can't, can't talk about it, but Aww. I shouldn't Aww. bring it up right <laughs> away. So it's with some famous comedians. So uh, it's something I was so excited to find out I was going to do. So. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with some comedians in the past and didn't have great experiences with them, so, uh, but these guys I already know, so. We won't tell anyone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Says, says the YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> so one, this last parting comment type question with uh, Adam Green going back and putting in a lot of these female horror icons in the Hatchet films and these cameos, are we ever going to see Lars show up in the Hatchet Five? Yes! Yes! yes. yes. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. I guess Perry's got to talk to him. <laughs> Thanks, guys, so much for coming out. This was a lot of fun. Thank these guys so are here for the rest of the weekend. Go visit the